Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, JJ and uh, also Michael for inviting me here. And I'm uh, honored to be between these guests here, whom I always admired as my role models. And uh, uh, when I was listening to the speakers this morning and afternoon, I was thinking, why the hell am I not older? Normally, people <laughs> want to be younger, right? And uh, I had the same feeling at UCLA. Uh, we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the internet. I had the same feeling because somehow I missed those days that uh, I'm one generation after these folks. And uh, another one is that uh, I was in Germany. So what can I do? It was my destiny. So uh, when I was invited, I thought, uh, what will I talk about? And then I came up with this title, which really is appealing, right? Omnes viaje uh, aloha ducunt in Latin, and tutta la strada portana aloha, or uh, all roads lead to aloha, which is really the basic uh, 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 point that I would like to make here. And uh, so I will also tell you my own experience with uh, this field. So I found this paper, uh, Norm did not mention his paper, but he published uh, one in 2010, Michel Schwartz uh, invited him and, uh, for uh, communications history. And he gave a very nice, uh, I highly recommend it, very easy to read. And then he really tells more details than what he talked about it today. So well, I don't want to go through this again just to bore you, but I, t I can tell you my own experience. I was in Germany in the college, and in 1978, 1979, uh, I first time I heard about Aloha and uh, I still remember this vulnerable period of time that it takes two time windows to avoid collisions <laughs> and uh, then also the throughput was 18 percent I said my god you know it's so simple really I, I, it's so simple and after 40 years looking back that's the secret sauce. If you find simple solutions which make big impact, that's the way to do it, friends. So that's really like always everything is simpler, right? Afterwards you say, oh my God, it's so, such an easy idea. How the hell did these people come up with? Or Bob and Vint, for example, about TCP IP. I say, wow, so simple, right? <laughs> so, but it's not actually, you know. Afterwards everything is simple. So anyhow, uh, uh, so uh, I uh, started to do research on queuing network modeling, analyzing the packet losses, like Alec Kleinrock, uh, he was one of my role, he's one of my role models. And then my PhD was on queuing networks with uh, losses and finite buffers. And exactly 35 years ago, next week it will be 35 years ago, I emigrated to the United States. Had nothing. Meaning only the knowledge, six suitcases, my wife and two years old kid. I did not know anything about the U.S. education system. And I still don't know, but anyhow, so, uh, so then I continued and, you know, like, of course, we, uh, I was continuing the queuing network models, performance modeling, but then I started to say we need to, uh, more applications. So I got more in ATM networks than wireless ATM. And uh, that time also these multimedia uh, were coming up. And uh, so uh, I uh, started to work with URI systems, maybe some of you remember, they were doing wireless ATM for Battlefield. And the company was acquired by Lucent, $1 billion in the year 2000. So we uh, uh, designed the error control and uh, Mac layer. And uh, we used the uh, Aloha type access protocol and especially for the reservations, uh, because we had this multimedia traffic. So we had to do something to reserve some channel for the uh, real-time type video and audio. And, and so, uh, you know, you also see these here. And, uh, uh, and I also, at that time, worked on uh, 2G, 2NFG, mobility management, location registration, resource allocation. And always we used Aloha. That's why I will keep repeating, all roads lead to Aloha. So when you look at these call setups, call registrations, uh, location registrations, 
always they use a lot of type random access scheme. And this was also mentioned by Norm, by the way, in his papers. Not our work, but you know what other people did in these mobile uh, systems. So we, I, I assume that everybody knows about Aloha. So uh, the problem is the collision. It was again mentioned before. These, uh, uh, you know, basic Aloha, slotted Aloha, reserved Aloha, they always have collision problems, and the collisions lead 18% uh, uh, throughput. With simple uh, tweak, I w it was, I, I think, Binder or Crowther reserved aloha, but, you know, slot aloha and reserve aloha, they doubled it to 37%. And then there was this problem, it was also mentioned by Luigi this morning, instability problem. That means the latency goes like to, uh, you know, infinity when you have very large number of uh, users, they contend and they collide. So these two guys, uh, Fritz Schaute or Schaute, a Dutch guy, I heard that 2000, uh, he just uh, uh, retired and went to a boat and is living there in uh, Holland. Uh, and then uh, my colleague at uh, Russian Academy of Science, Boris Tsibakov, uh, they came up with these dynamic frame lengths and also stack algorithm for collision resolution to address these instability problems. So, now, the saga still continues because where uh, uh, Norm dropped the ball. I thought I will take from there and then continue to explain uh, what is uh, what happened since those years. So I have, you know, again, you see in the middle point is Aloha. There are these wireless sensor networks. Again, it was mentioned before this morning uh, by Norm. Then the IOTs. Then uh, I will talk about underwater dynamic spectrum access, cognitive radios. Manes and Vanets and 4G and 5G, name them, all these network paradigms always go back to Aloha. So all roads uh, you know, lead to Aloha. So now for wireless sensor networks, for example, there are thousands of papers on Mac. It, I always make, made a joke, each time people went to a bathroom, they wrote a paper on Mac protocols. <laughs> <laughs> really, and I look at all these names. JJ has six of them. <laughs> but really good ones because I teach them in my classroom, right? So look, you know, there are uh, many on random access, some TDMA, but it was stupid in my opinion because synchronization is not easy in these uh, sensor networks because they have very primitive clock crystals. You cannot do TDMA. I mean, when I saw papers, then it was stupid. But then what happened is they used the uh, random base access schemes and some of the uh, TDMA, like hybrid schemes, and they put a, a IEEE 82.15.4 standard. So when you look, you know, unslotted CSMA, that's the classical, uh, you know, Aloha type, and the other one is the slotted Aloha type. So back to SSR, back to the same basics, right? So it's 80.15.4, it's still act valid, by the way. So IoT, everybody talks about IoT, right? So now when you look at this, uh, the, the latest ones that they're really catching up, LoRa, Sigfox, Ingini, when you look down, they're all using, again, unslotted Aloha, unslotted Aloha, or random phase multiple access type schemes. So again, back to Aloha again. So now, it was also mentioned before, uh, the question was not right, I don't know who asked, but uh, th that person said the IEEE 8.11 used TDMA, I was shocked because there is no TDMA. So all the things that uh, uh, you see, all these developments here from AX, AY, AC, AD, AH, all of them BEs, they always use for call setups, call connections, still Aloha type scheme. Right after that, they can do allocation, scheduling, etc. But they always use Aloha folks. Okay, so please keep that in mind, because one of my uh, uh, colleagues at Russian Academy of Science in Moscow, that I have a position there too, so he's representing us at the I thought 11 uh, meetings, like 10, last week they were in Irvine for the meeting. So now, uh, here's another domain. 
Underwater acoustic networks is also a very important subject now. So uh, uh, one of the issues was using what type of MAC protocols, access control protocol we should use. So like in the beginning, I was thinking, of course, Aloha, because the number of transponders that they will be de deployed, that there are not too many. You can use Aloha. But then, but you cannot publish it, right? <laughs> because you, nobody will publish it. They say, well, you say Aloha, slot Aloha. They say, OK, but there's no meat there. We cannot publish it. So, but some people, like these two uh, folks, I mean, these two papers, they went back to Aloha and they were lucky and they uh, got their papers accepted. But, you know, when you look from the uh, basic contribution perspective, you say, so what? So, but what we did is uh, for the Navy in the you know, early 2000s, uh, we did CDMA uh, because of the, all the security mechanisms. But again, back to Aloha because this, this was distributed CDMA. When you look at the uh, CDMA in cellular phone systems, it's a centralized because there's a base station, right? You can do code uh, allocations. But when you do distribute it, you need to find some way that the devices will know about the codes. So for that, we use a simple packet. We inform each other about the code which they will use. And we use Aloha. So it was a mix of you know, uh, Aloha with CDMA. And uh, here is another uh, you know, area, dynamic spectrum access. Military was interested, and they are still interested, cognitive radio networks. These were my people. They wrote these uh, overview papers that you can see again, sing whether single radio, because we, we start to have here multiple radios, especially for the dynamic spectrum access networks. So again, uh, most of the uh, MAC protocols are using uh, random-based schemes. At the end, because of the simplicity and also straightforward uh, uh, applications, always we go back to the uh, 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 Aloha. So now, look at the Manes and Vanes. Uh, Vanes. Like, uh, for example, ad hoc networks was mentioned by Jim Freiberg-Seiser. There are like, I don't know, maybe 20,000 papers. Alone on routing, maybe five, 6,000 papers. So what they do is, you know, normally they didn't care about the access control. Routing, right? You know, we need to find path. Majority of the papers on ad hoc is routing. But what they do, they say flooding. But the flooding is done by using uh, uh, Aloha. Nobody was talking about explicitly, you know. Same thing in Manes, you know, mobile ad hoc networks. To establish these uh, uh, path connections, you need Aloha type uh, uh, protocols. And same thing when you use these uh, uh, vehicular ad hoc networks with all these uh, uh, standards, A to dot 11P and WAVE, again, they are using Aloha, or at least you know, Aloha time, you know, a little bit here and there. So this was also mentioned today uh, by uh, Bob and uh, uh, Vint about, and also Norm, of course, especially Norm. That's right, he mentioned about this 4G, 5G. Again, when you look back 2G and 2.5G, when we started to have all these uh, uh, you know, multimedia services, we needed always these call setups, resource allocations, etc. And until now, we are always using Aloha type uh, uh, handshakes, call setups, call delivery. Uh, it's all based from the beginning. Yes, uh, it's on 5G, on 4G and 5G. It's still continuing. Like when you look at this random access channel procedure especially initial attached to base station and handovers, and they're always based on the uh, Aloha type access control. So 4G standards, all of these LTUs, et cetera, uh, they're all using Aloha type access control. And 5G, it was not mentioned by uh, uh, Norm today, there is URL, URLC, Ultra Reliable Low Latency Systems. They're using Aloha, okay? and all these IOTs, for example, right? So, now, my, in my opinion, Saga will continue. So, I still believe that all roads will still lead to Aloha, even in 6G and uh, 
NG wireless systems. Okay, like you see here, all of these new. Uh, there's an article that we uh, produced lately. So like 6G will have all these uh, uh, networking paradigms. I hope uh, you know uh, you will hear more and more of these things. Uh, for example, higher frequencies, you know, going to terahertz, for example. No, no more 60 gigahertz. Or we have these intelligent environments that we are creating these platforms that they will help to combat the wireless uh, uh, challenges, like all these wireless channel effects. Uh, uh, please pay attention to that because it's coming. Like every day, papers are being written about these intelligent surfaces. So it's a, it's a new way of reflecting arrays, but they're not reflecting arrays, intelligently done arrays. And the internet of tube sets, I will come to that too. And all of these things, of course, AI, quantum communications, etc. But uh, I want to go to say a couple more things because of the time. So the cube sets are really up and coming now. So uh, the cube sets are very small. Uh, this was introduced by California State University. It was not even a research university. So one unit meaning 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters is a cube. And it's very powerful and very easy to design them. We have one also we are designing with all these, you know, in this space they will uh, operate in terahertz because there are no atmospheric effects. For up and down we use these uh, dynamic spectrum access type dynamic front ends for the transceivers. So, uh, and then again we, will, we are using uh, Aloha type but we are not the only ones. You see all these companies like Astrocast from the company else in Switzerland, Fleet from Australia, Kip, uh, the Kepler company from uh, Canada, it's now California. So then uh, Icetech from Espana or Spain, and even Iridium Next USA, all are using variants of Alahas. So they are all listed here. And uh, also, uh, many years ago, when we started to do these uh, nanoscale machines using graphenes, we saw that they end up in very high frequencies, terahertz. And then we realized that you cannot use these classical protocols, like all these you know, protocols we know, from modulation all the way, Mac routing, etc. And then we realized, why can't we use so-called femtosecond long pulses, you know, boom, boom, very short. And as you see here, it's again <laughs> aloha type or slotted aloha. So this femtosecond long pulse is immediately transmitted and then another user uses, the prob of course there may be collision, but the probability is very, very low that they will collide because those pulses are so short. Yes, I know. Okay, so that's like another aloha, right? Here is another thing that's really up and coming, and even uh, like Eric Schmidt mentioned that uh, at uh, internet meeting, and also brought uh, 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 come a uh, uh, person, Henry Samueli, so this is really like on the crossroads of the medicine, uh, bioengineering, and uh, telecommunications and computer networking. So these are like bio nano things that specially designed to uh, uh, synthetic eukaryotic cells, like human cells, or uh, 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 eukaryotic and uh, uh, bacteria, for example, cells. Again, genetically engineered, they will be injected inside the body and they will create a, a network and they will communicate. So since uh, 10, 12 years I work on these, uh, we had uh, you know, large projects on these. So uh, this is really like uh, a truly interdisciplinary research. And at the end of the day, because there will be a network, right, but, but, but it's very highly mobile, okay, and they are in the wet environment. So how do you take care of all the communication, right? Like location tracking, access when they want to communicate or send something. So you see here at the left side, there are again random based, a lot of type access control protocols are being discussed. So concluding remarks, I know that I have my time is up. So why is Aloha, you know, what is the secret sauce, right? Because it's five layer agnostic, right? When you look at, like for example, in the 4G, also the newest uh, A2.11, we're always using OFTM. But, uh, you know, uh, OFTMA uh, is always based or, or is, uh, is uh, on top of the OFTM. Or 
uh, multi-user MIMO. It must use MIMO system, physical. But Aloha is independent of anything. Uh, you know, you can take a truck and you can use Aloha, for example, right? So it's powerful, you know, powerful in the sense of really it's simple. You can easy, easily explain it to your uh, grandmother even. And everything is positive except, except scalability and collisions. And that can cause energy and uh, bandwidth. We, we know about it, especially when we have very uh, a dense network. And in my opinion, again, uh, we look back 20, 50 years, uh, when you look, I, I just showed you, Allah is everywhere, really. And what I believe is, in my lifetime, uh, I hope I will be here, I still believe that uh, Allah will still be here, unless we will change our communication paradigm in our minds, suddenly coming from another angle. So look from another angle, then we may say, okay, with all these things are not needed anymore, forget Allah. But I believe Allah will be here. And uh, I also ask all of us, isn't it time for a new revolutionary idea than Allah, right? So thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you, JJ, for organizing this event and giving me the opportunity to say thank you. I would we'll go back and tell some of my story and how I did get uh, to do research on wireless and wireless networking in general because influenced by, by the papers. I, will, I read, I think, 95 of the papers that, for instance, Luigi mentioned in his presentation and, of course, uh, all the basic paper on the Aloha Net, uh, which I teach every semester, but also, of course, were part of my, of my initial formation. But instead of uh, looking at uh, my story, well, way less interesting than uh, all the stories that we have heard today. I want to show how, based on these 50 years of history, uh, right now at my school, we have really started um, to build on that, and heavily on that. As you will see in my presentation, in my little publicity stunt, if you want, because uh, uh, my friend says that I don't talk well, so they prepared a video that is better for me to to show instead of uh, illustrating it myself. And, um, and it's really based on what we have seen today so far. Uh, in a very collegial way, we, have, we come from uh, most of the people in this room uh, by formation and so on. Uh, I will repeat half of the slides that Ian has just showed us because uh, uh, half of my colleagues come from his group. And, uh, and uh, on that note, again, I want to show the research that we're doing in wireless IoT specifically. The motivations are many, and they've been illustrated today, and of course uh, uh, don't need too much of an of a, um, explanation. It's, it's uh, real, uh, it's important, uh, and it's something that everybody is looking, is looking at. And as such, uh, in, uh, in my university in Northeastern, back in Boston, we have put together an institute that uh, has uh, brought back uh, a lot of knowledge, not only in wireless, but also in many other disciplines, including economics and computer science. And, uh, and uh, uh, for us, uh, something that is uh, a little less well known, the physical layer. I, I come from computer science background, and many of my colleagues are computer engineers. So, we put in uh, very many electrical engineering into the equation, including and especially uh, material people. So here is the video. I hope it does a better job. It's a little on the publicity side, but. Uh From here. At Northeastern University's yeah. Institute for the Wireless Internet of Things, we are driving advances in systems, networks, and artificial intelligence to transform how people connect, communicate, and thrive worldwide. This is our vision for the next generation Internet of Things, a continuum of untethered objects and devices, all interacting with people and the environment in ways that are exponentially faster, more efficient, and more secure. 
Institute faculty offer interdisciplinary expertise with strengths in communication and networking, sensors and energy harvesting, data analytics and machine learning, security and blockchains. We engage 130 researchers across Northeastern University in Boston and its innovation campus at Burlington, Massachusetts. Their research spans fields from cybersecurity and privacy to robotics, nanotechnology, and marine science. Our research priorities include 5G and 6G wireless systems, autonomous aerial vehicles for civil and national defense, smart cities and oceans, smart and connected implantable medical devices, artificial intelligence for wireless systems, millimeter wave and terahertz wireless communications. In our quest to create autonomous networked systems that operate even in challenging, uncertain and extreme conditions, we innovate by collaborating. To attract the best ideas and perspectives, our institute forges partnerships with academia, government and industry, attracts distinguished faculty and exceptional students, provides world-leading, experience-powered education through the doctoral level. Leading-edge projects tackle challenges from data insecurity to chronic diseases, energy scarcity, disaster response, and threats to the national defense. Intrabody medical systems. For patients with chronic diseases, we're devising tiny sensors and actuators that transmit power and data using unconventional wireless techniques that are safer, more secure, and more energy efficient. Internet in the sky and underwater by enabling drones and other technologies to synchronize their sensing, communications, and movement autonomously. To learn to foil adversaries by listening to the wireless spectrum and continuously changing their modes of communication. Blockchain technologies ensure that digital transactions remain transparent and verifiable to all parties. These systems require vast amounts of energy. We are harnessing AI to enhance their efficiency for use in IoT systems. Wireless Internet of Things unique facilities includes Colosseum, the world's largest RF networked emulator, a unique 21 rack computational data center with programmable radios in the loop that can emulate large scale wireless systems. PAWR, innovation in powering IoT. We are the project office for platforms for advanced wireless research, a $100 million public private partnership that aims to find new ways to power IoT. Arena, an open access wireless testing platform featuring 32 software-defined radios and 64 antennas in a ceiling-mounted grid with a scale and computational power to foster the development of new technologies in the crowded sub-6 gigahertz 5G spectrum bands. Expeditionary cyber and unmanned aerial systems R&D facility. An indoor-outdoor laboratory with an anechoic chamber Faraday cage and 150 by 200 by 60 foot netted area for testing unmanned aerial and ground technologies, antennas and navigation and communications equipment. We are driven by our willingness to solve technological challenges that will create a better world. A world with better medical devices. A more secure world where cutting-edge technologies protect our networks and our data. A world where technology can help us observe and explore our planet, from its oceans to its skies. A more connected, observable, and programmable world. So his accent, I've been told, is better than mine. I hope you, you, could, uh, you, could, uh, you could see that. Just uh, to add to that, however, I think that uh, this expertise comes really from uh, those shoulders that uh, have been mentioned many times today. Uh, we are really convinced that what we do right now, which is you know, based on the very many problems that we see out there, comes from these past 50 years of research, from packet switching especially, and, uh, and uh, the packet radio, the wireless packet radio, that all uh, me and my colleagues uh, remember and have built our own uh, PhD thesis first and our own careers with projects and so on. In general, for the Institute, these are 
our main area of interest it goes from uh, tactical and strategic communication a lot of underwater stuff that comes of course from the seminal work of uh, Mario Gerla and uh, Jana Kilditz and uh, and their and their uh, work in networking again communication has been explored but networking up until then was never we have a great facility right outside Boston where we can actually deploy and experiment uh, with the technology we developed uh, Jim was just mentioning the work at BBN on, uh, on underwater communication and networking, we are designing the next uh, uh, acoustic modem. And guess what? Uh, nobody has, uh, uh, actually, except Ian, has mentioned how well Aloha actually goes uh, underwater, taking advantage of the, of the delay of the, of the lower data rates on one side, but especially on the delay of the acoustic medium, uh, the problem of collision and hence of throughput eventually is uh, mitigated and uh, Aloha works just uh, pure Aloha, meaning uh, without so many, so many um, addendum. Uh, in general, a smart IoT system, networking in contested environments, the next generation wireless, and the application of, it hasn't been mentioned here today that much, artificial intelligence and machine learning especially. I've read that at least in the past uh, five years, at least 10 papers, on uh, Aloha uh, aided by machine learning techniques for the determination of uh, uh, this slot, for instance, uh, uh, in the slotted Aloha, the duration and uh, the uh, slot assignment for repeating, uh, for repeating the, the transmission, which is uh, e eventually effective. Um, we have uh, a lot of industry partners, and uh, our programs and research is funded by many agencies. Uh, the uh, idea, again, is uh, uh, to reach out. That's what uh, the, the Institute uh, wants to be based on, and to foster an all kind uh, of partnerships. Overall, the Institute is people. What I like about it uh, as a core faculty is the collegiality. We all know each other, and we are, we are having fun, honestly speaking, and working with each other. The Institute is really a lot of people. And, uh, uh, we are not just looking at research, but I'm very happy that uh, we are heavily looking on how to improve education. Northeastern has expanded in some regional campuses. One is around the corner, like 10 minutes from here. And uh, we have some other in Toronto, Vancouver, uh, Seattle, Charlotte. And uh, we are looking into uh, building research um, besides uh, education, but also experiential PhD, for instance, new form of master and, and continued education all on our key expertise, which is, again, uh, uh, wireless. The Internet of Things has seen, and especially the wireless Internet of Things has seen uh, at the Institute, includes uh, a lot of research. These are just a few vignettes, as, uh, uh, some of which, again, uh, we have seen in the presentation today. Um, Bringing in the material people has helped us a lot in, uh, in challenging, with challenging problems like powers and in terms of uh, both sensors for the tactile internet and uh, uh, for uh, wireless communication and wireless sensor network and low energy, low energy sensor and low energy uh, low power consumption wake up radios have been uh, uh, something uh, some among some of our ongoing projects. Uh, Intrabody communication, again, is part of uh, the core research of the center at this time, and bringing, of course, the internet underwater. What uh, we do is actually also concerning designing new modems. The commercial modem that we have used so far, uh, which the acoustic modem, especially uh, very low data rates. So we are designing our own that maybe it's more short range, uh, 100 meters, 150 meters, but the current prototype, for instance, go up to 100 kilobit per second kind of data rate with acceptable uh, bit error rates. So we are building system, of course, uh, building on, on the great research. <coughs> At this time is uh, the channel that gives us uh, uh, most of the challenges, but we are already uh, ready with the protocols to implement on this. And uh, the MAC protocols, of, of course, are all based on on the Aloha system and the Aloha net ideas that you have seen today. This is part of the research that I brought into the center. It has to do with the uh, uh, wake up radius, something that has gone on for you know, over 15 years now. But we are coming up with the help of our friends in material people with something that uh, 
um, pushes power consumption out to the nanowatts and uh, reaches data rates that are uh, uh, really revolutionary in this sense. The, all the wake-up ready I've seen so far are in the realm of one to five kilobit per second on a good day, and, uh, and we have uh, prototypes right now that uh, uh, consuming nanowatts uh, have uh, two megabit per second kind of uh, data rates. Energy harvesting is one of our uh, core. Uh, my colleague, Kashik Chaudhuri, has been uh, doing this research, uh, building on wireless transfer of energy, especially on the constructive effect of combining, uh, or combining uh, um, the wireless charging from multiple uh, sources to one single receiver new ways of uh, looking at the 5G communication with uh, uh, 5G for 5G networking and in especially with software defined networking we uh, are going towards new paradigms for optimization and uh, uh, self-optimization actually of uh, uh, cellular networks. Millimeter wave and terahertz communication comes from uh, the expertise of uh, uh, many of my colleagues and me myself uh, I'm also involved in uh, channel characterization in the millimeter wave band and the design of MAC protocol, which again uh, are uh, heavily influenced by the uh, random channel mechanism that uh, we have seen uh, all day. Again, our experiment has uh, uh, almost immediately some experimental component uh, without going into that many details. So this is a millimeter wave antenna that we got from Facebook, for instance, that is uh, mounted on a drone and uh, is leveraging information about uh, for instance, GPS to find uh, uh, the best beam forming pattern and the best channel around uh, um, a given uh, base station. And uh, as mentioned in the little video, I want to point out and conclude uh, with, the, with the fact that uh, uh, our program and our interest is really about uh, reaching out and enabling uh, testing of a future wireless system. The power program is one example. But most importantly, I want uh, to mention that uh, recently we got uh, this instrument from DARPA called Colosseum that was designed and used for a Spectrum Collaboration Challenge. Colosseum is a really big uh, um, channel uh, emulator with the hardware in the loop. And the, the difference of Colosseum uh, with the old, let's say, or current um, wireless uh, channel emulators is that uh, the number of channels that you can actually emulate at the same time, which in this case is in excess of 65,000. And so the scenario that you can be creating to try out your, uh, your uh, um, solutions are uh, realistically big. Section of cities and of course uh, uh, strategic uh, um, emulation of uh, of a channel in, uh, in very dense and crowded networks like arenas or disaster scenarios involving many people and so on, wanting to communicate and so on. This is uh, something that uh, we just received in November and that we are preparing to make accessible to the whole community. So if you are interested in, uh, in uh, working on uh, scenarios with a large number of channels all together and uh, in a completely repeatable and accessible setting, um, this uh, will be coming fairly soon. Uh, the power program will be, for instance, one of the first to be associated with Colosseum. This said, thank you so much uh, uh, for uh, uh, having me today here. And uh, for anything, feel free to reach out or to ask questions uh, also offline. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting me, JJ. Uh, it's a long way from Brazil, but I, have, I had to be here because it's such a great day and to be you know, among all this, the people who made history in, in the networking and also, also, of course, to be here meeting all the former lab mates and all the COCO, uh, how, we, uh, how we express the uh, students in the JJ's lab. And of course, with my advisor, my tormentor. Uh, <laughs> so um, this talk, uh, we are here to celebrate uh, the 50 years of Aloha and also all the protocols that came later 
uh, especially CSMA. And these, these protocols, they are, they are such great ideas, they are so great that to this date, we still want to take the most out of it. So we are still trying to squeeze and make the most out of it. So, and what I'm gonna present to you today is one such an attempt, is uh, a joint work I did with JJ just recently, and I'm gonna uh, present to you today. So, uh, random access protocols, chain access protocols, uh, many challenges ahead, because as we know, wireless traffic is growing steadily. Uh, Cisco always does these projections and show that by 2022, 79% of all IP traffic is gonna be about uh, Wi-Fi and mobile, mobile uh, uh, through uh, cell phones, our cell phones. And we now have different applications and uh, like industrial plants, farms, new environments that they pose new challenges because now we have larger propagation delays and identification, more devices, more connections, and more device over a special area. And what is challenge, and uh, it was mentioned here many times, is to how to address traffic prioritization, how to prioritize traffic in such protocols, especially now that we want to have reliability and low latency, and of course, still to guarantee and have spectral efficiency, we want high throughput, uh, energy efficiency, fairness, all these issues that come together. So it's really a challenge. And in this talk, uh, we're gonna be back to basics. We're not gonna address fancy physical air stuff that's going on. We are back to single channel, single antenna, half duplex radios, as was thought in the CSMA. And we want to point out that most of the design of CSMA protocols, they had in mind that when you have a collision of packets, we all have to give up. And the stations that had the collisions, had, they have to try another time. That was mentioned many times here. And unless you have the capture effect that we are not addressing here. So we're not taking into account any physical layer stuff. So uh, just to, uh, we're gonna talk CSMA here. So just to remember, uh, when you have CSMA, uh, if a station has a packet and wants to transmit, has to be polite. Check the channel, if, uh, do the carry sensing. If nobody's transmitting, I'm in a have a packet, which is the case of this blue packet here. I go ahead and transmit my packet. But then this packet takes uh, some time to reach other stations. So what we call the trans propagation delay, which will take it by this time, during this time, if any other station has a packet to transmit, it will perceive an idle channel and will go ahead and transmit also their packets. And then we have the collisions. So that's why we call the propagation delay uh, this key parameter that was mentioned before. Uh, the, CSMA, and within this time, things can go bad. So, and in, in CSMA, we have actually the, its uh, performance is related to the propagation delay, the ratio of the propagation delay in the transmission time. So the smaller this ratio, the better the uh, performance of CSMA. But then we, in the recent uh, time, we have, you know, uh, devices are getting better, and we have a key parameter that has decreased a lot in the in the, past, in, the few, in the past decades, which is the turnaround times of half duplex radios. So uh, if I'm using half duplex radio, I have to, tr before tr receiving, I have to switch from transmit to receive, and that takes a while. And this parameter now is about one to two microseconds, much uh, smaller than or the, uh, the turnaround times of previous radios. So we're gonna use that in this talk, and, and uh, the good news is that when you have this kind of turnaround time, uh, we are talking about the, almost the same uh, uh, dimension as the maximum pro propagation delay in current, dub, uh, current wireless local area networks and some IoT scenarios. So um, let me just go uh, straight to the idea. We call this carrier sensitive multiple access with transmission acquisition. The idea is very simple and I'm gonna present you first without the turnaround time. And uh, if a station has a pack to transmit, has to do the carry sensing. If uh, the channel is clear, I go ahead and transmit a pilot packet with a fixed length, which we call uh, uh, the gamma seconds, the, the length of this pilot first, before the data packet. 
And after transmitting this pilot packet, I have to wait for another time that we call, uh, it's exactly the propagation delay in the network. <coughs> and after waiting for this propagation delay, I have to do the carrier sensing again. And if, I, if the channel is clear, then I, I claim that I have the right to transmit, I have acquired the right to transmit, and then I proceed with my transmission uh, of my data frame. Otherwise, I have to back off. Let me give you uh, an example. Uh, in this case here, you have A, is, you have two, three stations, they are 1,000 seconds apart from each other, and uh, station A transmits its pilot packet in this exact moment here, T0, and it takes 1,000 seconds to reach the other stations. So meanwhile, B and C has a packet, so they also transmit their pilot packets, which lasts in gamma seconds. And according to the protocol, they have to wait for 1,000 seconds before sensing the channel again. So in this figure, uh, so this is the packet from A, which will reach B and C at this time. The packet from B will reach A at this time. The packet from C will reach A here and B here. And both A and B will have to do the wait for 1,000 seconds. And then A, when A is done, it will perceive a busy channel. And so it will refrain from transmitting. The same will happen to B, because although uh, the packet from A is done during the waiting time of 1,000 seconds, the packet from C will still be perceived by B, and B will refrain from transmit, because when it does the sensing again, it will see you know, uh, the interference from the from packet from C. And then C, when, when C is done by waiting with this time, uh, the propagation delay, the tau seconds, it will see a clear channel. And then you go ahead and transmit its packet. So we are very excited. Oh, that's nice. Uh, we should try that. And actually, it's very good, but we have the turnaround times. So if we actually take into account the turnaround time, now things don't get so uh, good as we thought. But then instead of waiting for the tau seconds, especially because the turnaround times are greater than propagation delay, we have a new rule, which is to wait for the transmit to receive turnaround time before sensing the channel again. So let epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 be the receive to transmit turnaround time and the transmit, receive to transmit, <coughs> transmit to receive turnaround times. With that turnaround time, when you take that into account, now the vulnerable period, the vulnerable period now it's epsilon 1 plus tau. Because let me show you this picture. When A checks the channel here, it has to switch mode, so it takes epsilon one seconds to transmit its pilot. And the first signal from A will reach B here. So we have all this time here, which is the vulnerable period now with the turnaround time taken into account. So A will transmit its packet and then has to switch again to do the carry sensing, which takes epsilon two seconds to listen to the channel again. And the same happens to B. We take uh, after Y seconds, B decided to transmit its packet, so does the switching from receive to transmit, transmits the, its pilot, and then has to commute back and do the sensing. In this scenario here, bo in both cases, uh, they will listen to a free channel, and they will go ahead and transmit the packets, and they will collide. So it doesn't work the way we want it, so we, look, we should look at the likelihood of having a successful transmission acquisition in this scenario. So let me show you the condition for, in order for the trans, uh, transmission acquisition to happen. So suppose A transmits, uh, decides to transmit its packet here at T0, and Y seconds later, B decides to transmit its packet, its pilot packet. So in order for this previous situation to happen, we want that the pilot packet from B to be perceived by A by the end of its switch time to receive. So the condition for having a successful transmission acquisition by B is that Y plus epsilon 1 plus gamma plus tau has to be greater than epsilon 1 plus gamma plus epsilon 2. And then, which gives us the key condition that this, as long as B decided to transmit its pilot uh, in a transmission time that is greater than epsilon 2 minus tau, we have a successful transmission acquisition. Uh, so, and this will also happen to when you have many transmissions. 
as long as the last guy who decides to transmit uh, his time, his last time, with respect to the next to the last who decide to transmit is greater than epsilon 2 minus tau, we have a successful transmission acquisition. So this is the key thing. Before, in CSMA typical scenario, we have success as long as nobody transmits in the vulnerable period, epsilon 1 plus tau. But now, we have a successful transmission acquisition if you can have many transmissions attempts during the vulnerable period, but as long as the difference between the last to the next to the last to decide that decide to transmit is greater than epsilon 2 minus tau, you have a successful transmission acquisition. So uh, with that idea of pilots, we also extended the idea to how can we have prioritization in the channel access. So this is very different from having to prioritize, prioritize traffic within a station. So I decide, oh, vo voice goes first, then data inside my station. What I want to do here is prioritize within the, uh, among those frames that are colliding at that moment in the channel, over the channel. I want to have a winner that has higher, higher priority over the others. So what we do is basically uh, we establish a pilot signal, gamma k, that has to be specific for each priority class. Okay? And suppose we have k priority classes. Uh, and in our scenario here, uh, a class, a uh, certain type of traffic has lower priority than CJ, CI has lower priority than CJ, if I is smaller than J, okay? Uh, so I'm going to give you the conditions, for instance, to ensure that regardless of when B decides to transmit its pilot packet, A will always win because it's trying to, it's trying to transmit in, uh, a uh, high priority packet. So here the situation is as long as uh, we have epsilon 1 plus gamma 2, which is the highest priority traffic, plus tau, uh, has to be greater than y plus epsilon 1 plus gamma 1 plus epsilon 2. And that gives us the condition that the pilot packet from the highest priority traffic has to be greater than this, the previous pilot packet plus the sum of the turnaround times. And that goes for the other type of traffic class. So with that, uh, I'm just going to show you some performance analysis. I'm not going to, of course, don't do any math here. And we're going to use the same previous type of scenario that uh, Tobaji did uh, in his CSMA papers, papers, and we are considering packets from different classes. Okay, when they collaborate, they, uh, the, the portion of the traffic is different. So we're going to compare with CSMA, Pharma PJ, which chain is here. Uh, did this uh, work when we're trying to do emulate CSMA CD in wireless networks um, with half a duplex radius and using CSMA CD as a benchmark because as it was said here CSMA CD does, uh, was, uses full duplex so you can transmit and receive at the same time. So, and we are considering turnaround times of two microseconds with those uh, lengths of, for the pilot pack. So let me show you first when you have a s small rate, uh, 1500 bytes, and the network radius is not so long, so great, and which means that the turnaround time is six times the propagation delay. So this is uh, CSMA, is the red curve. CSMA TA is the blue one, not so much different from CSMA. And this is CSMA CD, and the, the dashed line is CSMA without the turnaround time. And the green line is CSMATA in the ideal case when you wouldn't have the, the turnaround time case. So not much excitement here, but when you make the turnaround time uh, just 1% of the propagation delay, and then you do have the advantage of CSMATA, which is actually much better than even CSMACD if you use you know, the formulation that used to, uh, we have in the, in the papers. And this is CSMA, this is Pharma PJ, and CSMA CD. And uh, if we increase the data rate, now we have much uh, the impact of the overhead. So, but and this is the case when uh, still we have the turnaround time is almost the propagation delay, just 1% larger than propagation delay. And then we have the performance of CSMA TA here, which is much better uh, than CSMA, Pharma PJ, 
and CSMACD. And just showing two cases for, the, for prioritization. And one scenario is when the, the highest priority traffic accounts for 40% of the traffic. And so, and we are comparing with CSMA. And we see that uh, in the same scenario when you have 5%, here is 5%, the turnaround time greater than the propagation delay. And you have the boost that uh, and the different, the treatment of the different uh, traffic and still giving the boost for each priority class. This is the smallest priority traffic. This is a throughput, okay? Uh, for those who are not used to, this shows the, how much data I'm transmitting, efficiency, so it goes from one, from zero to one. And this is the normalized load, which we call how many packets I transmit <coughs> during the packet transmission time. And a very interesting scenario is the, when the highest priority traffic uh, accounts for is, is just forms the smallest portion of the traffic, just 2% of the traffic, okay? So we have the case still, I have more case in the paper, but uh, I'm showing just a few here. 1,500 bytes, one megabits per second, and the distance is 571 meters, which means the turnaround time is 5%. And it's interesting to see that this is the highest priority traffic, just imagine voice. So, and you have a high load here, you have a lot of competition, is the highest priority traffic who gets through as opposed to the other traffic that uh, has, still has a gain here for, pharma, for um, CSMATA, the, uh, for the other, port, the other types of traffic. But the lowest priority, the highest priority traffic, which is the smaller portion, gets through uh, in ahead of all the other traffic that we have. So I, I apologize for, for rushing a bit. Uh, so with that, I conclude the, the view of, you know, it's just uh, paying the homage here, one a more proposal for CSMA, uh, for half duplex single channels, single antenna radios. And the idea is to seek to increase the likelihood of having a successful transmission acquisition among a group of collider stations. And it can actually perform better than CSMA and CSMA CD used as a benchmark if turnaround times are close to propagation delay or smaller. And with this idea, we can allow, we have traffic prioritization among frames who are being transmitted at the same time over the channel, uh, stations who are trying to transmit that. And it's particularly strong, as we saw, when you have high load and the turnaround times is very close to the propagation delay, which means we can cover more on the high uh, offered low, high traffic. And of course, this is theoretical. We want to uh, embed this idea into IEEE 22.11 and consider all the issues like the physical layer, the impact of uh, heterogeneous propagation delays, back off, and of course, the, how to deal with hidden terminals as well. So with that, I conclude my talk, and thank you. And if you want more details, it's more in the Hi, everyone. Um, again, JJ, I have to thank you for, and Michael, of course, for organizing this amazing event. Uh, it's been, a, it's been a, an honor uh, and a lot of fun. Um, so, um, here in my talk, I want to again um, talk about Aloha, of course, and how Aloha has influenced um, research in, in wireless, and uh, in particular, um, talk about when the internet met wireless, and, uh, and then uh, you know, um, a few uh, considerations on, on the internet of wireless everything. And in that context, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in the lab. Um, I guess that works. So um, when I was preparing the talk, I had to go back and, and, and try to draw a timeline uh, to you know, position myself in time. And uh, um, as some of us know, um, there is the saying that uh, you have to look at the past to try to understand the present and, and try to predict the future. So, um, so again, of course, we all know Aloha happened 
in 1970s and then um, everything else that came after it and influenced by it, uh, the, you know, 802.11 specs and, and the Wi-Fi alliance. And actually, uh, this morning, um, you know, um, I think it was Vint that men mentioned Ethernet. And of course, I had to go in and put Ethernet there um, at the last minute. Um, and then, um, looking at the Internet evolution, I actually found this interesting uh, diagram. And as you can see, um, the, the, you know, it's summarized in these different, um, um, like, generations, like, you know, Internet 1G all the way to Internet 4G. Um, and then um, if then we overlay um, the Aloha um, phenomenon on top of it, and actually I didn't realize it until I was doing that, and, and Mark from the uh, Computer History Museum actually mentioned that today, that uh, the Aloha and Internet, they were actually born around the same time, right? And um, so, so they met, right? Um, and I guess we can discuss that, right? But uh, we can see that, uh, you know, the, do I have a cursor here? Yeah. So um, here's, you know, 802.11, the earlier versions, right? Around this time, and then uh, this is when you know, we are looking at smartphones, and then this is in, in the 2007, it, that's when I, the iPhone introduced uh, Mobile Lab, and then um, um, everything uh, that came after that, including the uh, um, so-called Internet of Things. Uh, uh, can you get sure. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Well, again, I so I was trying to combine, you know, the internet and and Aloha, right? And um, and in the context of you know um, motivating the internet of the internet of things or the internet of wireless things. But yeah, you're right. I should have talked about, you know. Packet radio and, and satellite. Right, but but um, so so this slide is about the meeting of internet and wireless, right? So I didn't want to leave the ARPANET or. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, but. Yeah, but what I was trying to call attention to is that uh, in the beginning, everything was, you know, wired, right, and, and stationary. And then, you know, things started to move. And, and that's kind of the idea I was trying to convey. But yes, thank you. I should mention um, satellite and packet radio. Yeah, thank you. So maybe I, you know, here, whoops. I should also have said that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so he, this is, again, many, many um, of those you know, reports have come out, but just showing the explosion in uh, wireless traffic. Um, and uh, so this is a report from Ericsson. Uh, saying that uh, you know uh, the the, traf the mobile traffic uh, continues to grow and the increase um, is uh, like for example in this in the, um, the, the this is quarter the la the third third quarter of 2019 uh, almost a 70 percent increase uh, in mobile traffic. So um, that was another. Um, um, Added that I did on my slide uh, as I was listening in this morning when Norm uh, mentioned the aloha of things. Um, and um, so if you look here, um, 
uh, and you know, this is act actually according to Cisco, they're saying that, uh, you know, they're um, saying that the Internet of Things um, wa you know, was, was born around this time when the number of um, uh, um, the, IO the number of IoT devices uh, was um, uh, grew uh, past um, uh, the number of people. And and uh, oops. so again, back to that ev evolution. Um, so and and trying to. I move the cursor. Yeah. So it's trying to um, uh, pinpoint some uh, important events uh, here as the internet evolved towards again the internet of everything. Um, then we also see the explosion on the number of devices that are being connected, uh, and in, in particular wireless devices. Okay. So again, we have you know these phases. Oh God. Uh, where you have the you know the so-called Internet of Places and then uh, Internet of People and then I Internet of Things and then finally you know the Internet of Wireless Things or the Internet of Wearable Things uh, that's um, you know a new uh, uh, term out there. So again, uh, looking at the future, there are of course many forces that uh, are. Ooh, are um, pushing the, evol the evolution. So there is what we call the push from above with all of these applications that are uh, coming online uh, that uh, we know about. Uh, there is also, so the, in, in terms of IoT, for example, there is this whole spectrum of applications from, you know, on that side, you know, low cost, low energy, uh, massive deployments, uh, and on this side, uh, then you have the ultra reliable, very low latency, very high uh, reliability applications, and of course everything in between. So we have an, an immense uh, variety of uh, requirements. And then, as we have heard this, you know, today, uh, also the um, 5G push, which is the push from below where you have all these uh, um, physical layer technologies that are also uh, pushing the envelope and also promising to solve a lot of the problems in latency and also um, dealing with uh, bandwidth. So, um, so the vision uh, of a, an internet of wireless everything is when you have, you know, so you have the internet as we know it and then we have all these um, uh, interesting uh, networks gravitating around it, and I know that I have very, you know, I don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to uh, talk briefly about um, a project that we've been working on, and actually I, I had other projects that I wanted to talk to you about, but I don't have time. Um, but um, this in particular, uh, and, and that was actually mentioned uh, um, before by, I think, Stefano, mentioned um, the uh, use of computational intelligence to improve the performance of Alhoa type systems. And that is work that uh, I've done with one of my PhD students and also a collaboration with a faculty member in Korea. Um, and basically the motivation is uh, to try to, so networks, we know that networks already learn, uh, some of the protocols already learn like, like TCP and even 802.11 can we do better? And uh, so what we did was again to come up with a very simple learning mechanism uh, that could be used in order to try to improve the performance of 802.11. And what we did, um, well, this is some motivation of machine, why we use machine learning, um, but I, I don't think I need to motivate that. And also, uh, some information about prior work that we did on using machine learning uh, connected to network performance. So um, it was not it was not that we were like riding the machine learning wave that uh, you know 
uh, was recently formed, but uh, we had done, done some work on machine learning before. And um, so basically what we did uh, very briefly is that uh, we introduced a very simple machine learning um, mechanism that uh, combined um, uh, EWMA, exponentially weighted moving average, with uh, weighted mechanism uh, that depending on the, the con you know, how the um, machine learning mechanism was doing, the weights were being adjusted, right, so that uh, it, the, the, the mechanism was adjusting automatically to the, to the current conditions. And we used that to um, regulate how RTS-CTS was being turned on and turned off in 802.11. And then, um, besides that, we then propose another simple mechanism to uh, adjust the, con the congestion window of 802.11 also in order to improve the performance. So, I, I how much time? Okay, so um, I basically don't have a lot of time uh, now, but um, I wanted to at least show you some um, quick graphs uh, that um, here, um, this is a, one of the example scenarios that we uh, show in the paper uh, where um, we have our, our mechanism which we call sense, so the red line, and then we have, we're again uh, tracking or trying to track uh, collision rates that are being measured uh, in a real network. And then <clears throat> the plain uh, machine learning mechanism, the, it's called fixed share, uh, is the blue line, I'm sorry, the green line, and then um, sense, you can see that sense is able to track much better the fluctuations in collision rate that are happening in real, and fixed share, uh, which is the original machine learning mechanism, is not doing so well. Um, and in fact, um, so here is a table that are summarized, that is summarizing the um, performance. Uh, in, 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 in the case of sense, uh, so this is the average error in relation to the, the real data, right? And then um, the error ratio in relation to what sense is uh, achieving is given by this other uh, row here. Um, and these are the EWMA equations, pure EWMA equations, um, and, all, and then the pure machine learning mechanism. And again, you know, we are showing here that SENSE can actually perform better uh, than, than any of these schemes and adj automatically adjust to the uh, fluctuations in, in, the, in the data set. Um, and then I, I just want to show quickly um, <clears throat> results for the congestion window adjustment. Um, again, <clears throat> using, again, a very simple machine learning mechanism to learn what the contention is, and then um, instead of uh, using uh, the binary exponential back off, which is the standard, we use a machine learning mechanism to learn and then adjust the congestion window accordingly. And I think I'm basically out of time, so I just wanted to finish by, since uh, this is a, an event that is sponsored by Citrus, I also wanted to uh, mention a couple projects that we've been working on that uh, are using wireless for social good, uh, which is sort of the theme that underlines uh, uh, Citrus, and, um, and of course both of them use wireless. Uh, so one is a collaboration between uh, UC Santa Cruz and then uh, UC Berkeley and UC Merced uh, with partnership with um, uh, CAL FIRE uh, that is trying to um, design and deploy the next generation wildfire monitoring detection and prevention system. Uh, of course, we all know about wildfires in California and how destructive they are. Um, and also another project with uh, uh, one of my PhD students, Sam, uh, on using IoT for, in the context of healthcare. So designing a system for persistent and autonomous um, patient monitoring, and that's a collaboration with UCSF. So I'll end here, and 
Thank you. So we have uh, time for a couple of questions. If I uh, may invite our speakers to come to the, to the front, and then we'll take uh, very few questions from the audience. So uh, Kevin, I happen to have a microphone here. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Um, so this was like at least partly the future section. And so one time in my life I had the fun of writing uh, you know, the, the earliest to latest thing on networking I could. I went back to 1680s, uh, which was a presentation to the Royal Academy that actually had RTS, CTS, and then the Shop Telegraph, which I think was the first wide area network. Uh, but nonetheless, so the right end of that spectrum of time was what is the most current thing I can think of that was the most speculative and I think it was some form of quantum communication of which there's been a variety of proposals and there's um, quantum swapping and so on. So what's the prognosis for quantum communication and uh, what do people, I mean this is like the right audience here, right? There's of course been optical, you know, wired quantum communication, but there's also wireless. And so what, what are we going to see? Is this going to work in any way at all? Or where are we headed? Yeah. Go ahead. Very good question, although it's not related to Wi-Fi, but uh, you know, when you look back, DARPA had a program many years ago, 10, 15 years ago, I'm not exactly sure about the time, like quantum computing. Somehow the wildfire didn't catch up. Same thing now with quantum communication. Uh, there is a European community a flagship program on quantum communications. And uh, there is also a lot of support here in the US. I think we have also a program on quantum communication. The problem is like IBM always says they have these new quantum computers. But again, the, the business is not there. You know, They cannot sell these computers. Uh, uh, the, 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 it's too complicated for certain operations that we are used to. And uh, my opinion is uh, it will catch up, but it will take 10, 15 years to uh, uh, see some actual uh, uh, use products of those. Uh, like quantum communication was very good, for, especially for the military, for the security purposes. And uh, yeah, uh, quantum communications, and that started like that. And now uh, I know of a lot of colleagues that uh, they think that uh, it's too complicated and the payoff is not there in terms of uh, you know, producing some useful results. And uh, for that, I recommend also people to work with physics people yeah. and you know, real uh, uh, interdisciplinary research so that you can have really useful uh, solutions. That's where we are. I hope I could answer your question. No? So, um, I, so there is this, you know, people are saying that, uh, Here. Quant well, I have, I, so people are saying that, you know, p uh, you don't need quantum computing to work for quantum com communication to work. I mean, one is not dependent on the other. Uh, so qu quantum communication, as Ian pointed out, I think they're, they're very um, specific but important applications like com you know, communication security, uh, things like uh, consensus. Um, but again, like Ian was saying, I think that we really need to understand the physics in order to be able to do something that you know, has some potential to work. And, uh, for the time being, it's really too cumbersome, you know. So when you apply for two nodes, I tried that, by the way. <laughs> it's not easy, really. You get frustrated. And uh, so that, you know, I made a comment here uh, at the end. Uh, we need maybe a new angle for communications, and maybe that's the way to go. I don't know. Is there something different that would be a new angle that you're that will be, I think so because you know you cannot do the, the way that we do all these protocols and all that you stuff. Have any I think. Why should I share it with you? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer, huh? Uh, uh, another question. Yes. 
Uh, in I mean, you cannot share everything. Come on. We should make some money, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Bob? I think he I think this is a question for Marcelo. Uh, you had a large number of curves that you had on the board. Yeah. So in this case, in that case, and uh, you know, the whole of mathematics was to get away from like tables and equivalent of lots and lots of curves. Were you able to draw any rules of thumb or insight from any of those curves that would give you more detailed insight into what's going on? Yeah, uh, I think that the key, the key information there is, uh, so what I want to convey to you guys was, we can do have the competition of the channel of those pilot packets, right? And as long as the time difference between when I decide and I'm the last guy in the group that I decide to transmit, and the difference between the time when I decided and you, which were the previous guy, the next to the last, decide to transmit, this difference was greater than the, uh, that epsilon two, the turnaround time <coughs> minus the propagation delay. Is, uh, is, if this difference is greater than that, we, I will be able to conquer the channel and transmit my data uh, right away. So it's, if you look at the papers, all the success probabilities and the stuff that we, we've seen in, pro, in MAC protocols, they talk about, and, and it, it decreases exponentially with the, the length of the propagation delay. And with that, we, we, we change, because now it's the difference of times that makes, that makes the key. You think uh, there's something any more fundamental than that in, in that collection of results? I would say, uh, so the, I think the key, the key part is um, that as we, uh, I think uh, it's kind of hard to, to grasp and what's the, if, if we're you, able. If you could spend the next month or two just I see. going through it, you it's, think you could come up with some more fundamental insights about what's, or is that about what's there? So I think the, the key point, and JJ can help <laughs> if he has all those insights as well, but I think the key point is if, if we are able to discriminate, because that's theoretical, but there is a limit also for when I decide and you decide and the last guy who decides. But fundamentally, it's not about the the vulnerable period, but it's about if if I'm part apart from you enough that I can okay and get the channel before you within those attempts. I guess maybe that's uh, one way of saying. Yeah. Uh, so I can give my opinion, but uh, Don has a. I don't think it's been said, but it seems to me the thing that saves multiple access is bandwidth. I mean, we went from the Aloha, which was 10 kilobits or something like that. And to me, to continue to save multiple access, the easiest thing is bandwidth to the person or whatever. And uh, that's been coming on in spades. I mean, it's revolutionary, as a matter of fact. I mean, whether you, whatever curve you're following. And so um, what Aloha started with um, was really a bandwidth constraint. To me, and now it's you know. So anyway, a fiber to the individual, for example, is a relief of that, without doing a lot of things we don't you know new things we. So it's uh, it's been um, first of all a comment. Uh, almost all of the wireless stuff eventually comes back down to the ground and ends up on a piece of fiber. So let's not forget that fiber is turning out to be our friend here. Uh, one question I have is uh, a little bit related to what um, uh, what uh, you just said, and that has to do with uh, uh, timing. Uh, Aloha, pure Aloha, is a wonderful environment where uh, it doesn't matter what time it is, because you know you just transmit and then you observe what happens. Uh, the first thing that we did to make it better was to try to synchronize the timing. So suddenly people have to know what time it is. 
So the question I have for you is, what role does high quality, high precision timing play in all of this? LTE, for example, is pretty dependent on having good quality time. And I worry, frankly, that uh, we're extremely dependent on things like GPS or GLONASS or some of the other uh, positioning systems and time, time delivery systems to make our communication systems work. Uh, is there any way for us to get away from that? Or in fact, is increased quality of time uh, continuing to be important to us in our communication systems? So uh, there was a DARPA report in 2014. Uh, they uh, mentioned four grand challenges bigger than internet. Maybe you remember that. Yeah, I'm serious. So let me go top down, uh, or yeah, bottom up maybe. So one of them was rapid threat assessment. Another one was virus shield for internet. Another one was terahertz. And the first one was atomic clocks. So, uh, so that's really, you know, it goes with your uh, uh, question. That's a huge grand challenge. So the device people are trying to develop the accurate clocking and also uh, sophisticated synchronization. And of course, uh, like if somebody asks you, will you put them on IOTs? I wouldn't. I mean, depending on the application, but it's really expensive. And also, you know, why do I need that strict uh, uh, synchronization? Uh, depending again, I have to say, depending on the application, right? But there are many other applications that, as you also mentioned with LTE or you know, in the 5G, there will be some uh, 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 demands like this URLC, for example, ultra uh, reliable, low latency, where the latency comes into picture. Many companies are trying to reduce this latency. And yeah, so yeah, my, mine included with the uh, yeah, Stadia, yeah. Stadia game playing and a twenty millisecond uh, exactly. target. Exactly, twenty millisecond. Yeah, yeah. Well, self-driving. Who always was saying that they can do ten millisecond, but I don't know. But, I mean, so they say a lot of things. But anyhow, so this is an important question, man. An excellent question, actually. So, so yeah, just one, one observation: NIST has produced some atomic uh, clocks on chips. They're literally uh, extraordinarily uh, low cost uh, and high quality, so that may contribute to solutions that still require a good quality time. So I, uh, I just wanted to make the comment that because I'm running this show, I promised myself and the audience that I wouldn't bore the audience with my opinion, so I'll keep quiet. <laughs> But you have the other microphone, so you can pretend to be. <laughs> uh, one more question, and we are ready for a break. I don't need that. I have a quick question from Marcelo. I'm just wondering if you have a plan to tackle the hidden terminals. What, what's your approach for that? Yeah, that's a, a very hard question because uh, the hidden terminal will mess up a lot of the things that we are thinking here. Um, but that that has to do also with the way we're gonna do the collision avoidance. Uh, how we're gonna play with the pilots? So we still we're still discussing how how to manage that because that's the scenario where we we all are seeing each other and we have a uh, it's no hidden terminal problem. See. But that, yeah, that is no easy solution, and I'll be happy to <laughs> discuss that with anyone here in the room. <laughs> 